Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I am Emmy Henley, the Managing Director of the Reform Alliance, and we are joined by Daryl Smith with the Department of Education. Um, the Reform Alliance is a statewide nonprofit that focuses on all education options. Um, we believe that every child should have equal access to a world-class education um, and tonight's presentation is just going to be understanding the education freedom accounts and what they will offer for students in the 24-25 school year. So I will let Daryl get started with his presentation and uh, introduction. Well, thanks, Emmy. I appreciate you. I appreciate the Reform Alliance for uh, hosting uh, this event tonight. We certainly do want to make sure that everybody has the good information, the right information, and can make the best informed decisions for their family uh, going forward. So we just wanted, wanted to let you guys know kind of what's coming down the pipe and what, what a year two looks like for the educational freedom accounts. And so, as Emmy mentioned, my name is Daryl Smith. I am the assistant commissioner here at the uh, Arkansas Department of Education in charge of uh, school choice and parental empowerment. So the educational freedom accounts kind of fall under my umbrella. And so we have uh, been working with that now for about seven months. We've kind of made it through our are halfway through the first year, and so we're excited. It's been a it's been a great start for us. We certainly uh, anticipate greater things in the future, and uh, looking forward to more and more participation as the years go on. So, let's kind of get started with our show. A uh, little presentation here. Uh, I think kind of the way we're going to work it, if that's okay with you guys, we're just going to kind of go through some of the uh, the parameters and some of the eligibility criteria and 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 how the program works just in general. And then we'll leave it uh, maybe open for some questions towards the end if anybody has some very specific questions about the program or qualifications or criteria. So that's okay with you guys. Spencer, let's uh, let's get the show on the road. Yes, and as he's pulling that up, I just want to remind everyone that there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, you can type them in there. All right. So we should be seeing a screen, I hope, somewhere. I can't see it, but there it goes. There we go. Now we're all in on the same page. So let's talk about those options in 2024 as we get ready to go into to year two. So Spencer, if you'll get us to that third slide, one right after the introductions, we can, uh, we can start through that. So let's talk a little bit about what educational freedom accounts are, just in case you're, you're kind of new to this whole process. Uh, the educational freedom accounts are what they it, uh, they are um, states where you receive ninety percent of the foundation funding that you can apply towards tuition or educational uh, expenses. So uh, it's a state administered. It's funding for education. It's a used for approved cost, and it's very flexible for families. It, it's uh, not only just for private schools, but homeschool will start coming online in twenty four twenty five, fully online in twenty five twenty six. Uh, the way the educational freedom account started is basically is that it's a kind of a three year ramp up. This is for this is year one. It's 23, 24. Basically, this was primarily for private school tuition and, and for those in, in, a, in a very defined eligibility criteria. As we move into 24, 25, those eligibility criteria, which we'll talk about in just a second, uh, have expanded. And then uh, as we move into 25, 26, the eligibility criteria is universal. So any student who is a resident of Arkansas will be eligible for the educational freedom accounts uh, beginning in the 25-26 school year. <clears throat> so as you can see on the screen, it does provide 90% of the foundation funding. This year, that was just a little over uh, or just a little under $6,700 per student to be applied towards educational expenses. It, for the most part this year, it was private school tuition. As we move into next year, it will be more towards instructional materials and curriculum and uh, fees and uh, testing and a lot of other things that would allow, again, for homeschool students now to be a part of that as long as they fit the eligibility criteria. So as we move on to the next slide, we'll see that, that this year, uh, so the 23-24, just a little over about we could serve about 7,000 students. We have about 5,300 in the program currently. And the criteria for this year was that you were a first year kindergarten, uh, that you have a, stu a student that maybe that was in foster care, a student that was uh, had a diagnosed IDEA disability, uh, was designated homeless, 
had attended an F-rated school in 22-23, uh, was a child of an active military student, uh, active military personnel. Uh, you were attended a school in a level five district, or you had, were awarded the Succeed Scholarship back in 22-23 that you were going to use for this particular school year. So that's where we started. As we move into this year, as we kind of with the eligibility expands, now we can go to 3% of the student population, which is approximately 14,000 students uh, we have space for in this particular year. And the eligibility re uh, requirements expand. So it goes back to, you can enroll in kindergarten for the first time this school year. So if you're a 24, 25 new kindergartner, you are eligible for this year. If you were in foster care, if you have a student with an IDEA diagnosed disability, if, uh, if you have a student that was uh, coded as homeless, if you came from a D or if you attended or enrolled currently in a D or F rated school, uh, if you were, uh, if you're a, a child of an active military or of a veteran or a reservist, all of that, uh, any, basically any type of military service, whether it's previous or current, uh, you're, you would qualify for this next school year. If you are a law enforcement, if you're a child of a law enforcement, or if a child of a first responder, then you are eligible for this school year. And again, remember, 25-26, every Arkansas student is eligible for EFA funds beginning again in 25-26. So as we continue to move forward, we'll see that... <clears throat> You can use funds for uh, a, a lot of different things. Like, again, it was pretty limited this year where it was tuition, fees, testing, expenses at uh, participating private schools. So basically it was just tuition and fees at private schools. As we move in and the program begins to expand, not only can you use it for tuition fees and at, at private schools, but you can also use it for instructional materials, uh, of courses and exam fees, instructional tutoring services, uh, approved educational devices, curriculum, transportation, educational supplies. Uh, and then if there's some one-offs or some things that are very specialized to your particular case and your particular student, certainly we'll, we'll take a look at those as well. Uh, the ex these expenses, this is pretty much the categories that will be uh, funded moving forward. And so you can again see as homeschool families, you can see how that these categories would fit well within the homeschool uh, mindset and the homeschool kind of uh, uh, educational model. And so as long as homeschool, again, fit within those categories that we just previously mentioned, then those expenses will be covered for this particular uh, year. And again, 25-26, all these expenses are covered for any student who joins the program and all students are eligible. And as we continue to move through our presentation, so let's talk a little bit about how you use it, all right? So uh, basically the way things work is that uh, you as, an, as a family don't ever really get money. We're not sending money to your bank account. We're not giving you a check. We're not giving you a debit card or anything like that. Basically what you're doing is you're gonna create an account with a vendor. Currently we use Class Wallet. And so basically what happens is once you get approved for the program, you set up your account within Class Wallet, and then the state then basically puts money every quarter into your account, which you can spend on tuition or service providers or uh, instructional materials or those types of things. And so um, basically what happens is that you uh, get an invoice from either a service provider or from your school or from uh, maybe a tutor or something of that nature. You upload the invoice and then we pay the invoice from your account. So again, you never actually have the money in your hands, but you do have it in your account. And so that way we're, we're able to kind of uh, track the, the money a little bit better. Again, it's important for us, it's important for our state uh, to be accountable and to be transparent with how the money's being spent and make sure it's being spent on the education of your kids and to, to help uh, improve the quality of education for your kids to make sure that again that you're getting the best uh, services provided for the for the money that's being spent. So we want to be able to track that and to be able to uh, also just have a nice clean record of how the money's being spent and where the money's being uh, sent to. So not only do you can you spend it like on the structural services and those types of things, but you can also spend it on school supplies, on uniforms. 
uh, on some of those types of things as well. And there will be more and more vendors on the platform, which is like I said, this right now it's in Class Wallet, where they will you'll be able to look at and buy, buy your uh, uniforms. It kind of works the same way. You kind of go to a cart, you pick what you want. The vendor gives you an invoice. We pay the invoice. They send you the materials, so the, the supplies or the uniforms or whatever uh, you it happened that you're that you're buying at that particular time. So it really is kind of like getting on Amazon in a little bit, and you you pick what you need, and then they send you an invoice, and then again we pay the particular vendor. Uh, vendors have to be approved, just like uh, families have to be approved, and so they, there's a process again to make sure that. Uh, uh, we have all good actors in the process and that, that there's a little bit of vetting that, that goes through the process to make sure that we've got good quality, reputable people that are being uh, th that are using and that are take, you know, that are offering their services to the families of Arkansas. So as we continue with our uh, presentation, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about what it means to apply. Like what what do, what do you have to do as a parent to apply and to, to be improved for the EFA fund. So basically, um, here's what you got to do. It's like, you can't be a public school student. So you've got to make a decision that we're not going to enroll in our local public school. Um, even though you can take courses at your public school, you can take a course or you can take a courses at your public school. You cannot be enrolled in your public school full time. Uh, you have to agree that you're going to use the funds for the uh, for those qualifying expenses. And we kind of help you with that a little bit uh, because of the approval process that you have to go through. Uh, you've got to agree, to, obviously, to the rules and the requirements that we have. One of those rules is testing, which we'll talk about here in uh, uh, just a second, that every student has to uh, to be tested uh, at, and, and SIN does those results. And, and lastly, as you can read on the screen, basically, if you're you as a parent are basically agreeing that you're going to make sure your kids are taking the core subjects, that they're, they're going to take English and their language arts and math and science and, and history, social studies, and that you're going to make sure that's happening. And so regardless of whether it's homeschool or a micro school or a private school or wherever, uh, whatever you choose for the, is the best education for your child, we're going to make sure that at least they're getting the core subjects taught in, in uh, wherever it, that happens to be. So I just wanna make sure again that you understand that this is uh, not for necessarily uh, for those that have enrolled in full-time public school, but for those that have chosen another option for their families, okay? And so as we move on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit, I think it's about testing. So we're gonna move into uh, the testing requirements and it's really pretty simple is that Every student who's taking, uh, who's receiving EFA funds is required to take some type of a norm reference test and return and then share those results with the state. And that that's pretty much, that's that's all that that slide says in a nutshell, is that whether you do it at a school, whether you are homeschool and you choose to do it elsewhere, whatever you do, you've got to basically have your child take a norm reference test you know, at, at the end of the school year and then send us the results. So uh, your EF funds can be used to pay for those tests, you know, and to pay for the testing. And so um, how you would, and we can certainly help you, you know, find the right test. We have a list of uh, probably 10 or 15 different tests right now that have been approved that are norm reference that you can certainly choose from. Uh, if you're not, not sure about that, or if you need, you know, it's like, I'm not really sure how that works or where you can get, have that done or who to contact, certainly you can always contact the Department of Education, contact me, contact our office, and we will be more than happy to uh, kind of walk you through that process and uh, give you some guidance on how to help you uh, fulfill this requirements for, for the EFA program. As we move on, Here's how it works. So let's let me just tell you a little bit about where we're at totally in the in the bigger picture, which not everybody kind of cares about or knows about. But there is a, when the law is written, uh, as the Learns Act was, uh, then from the law, we have to do these things called rules. And basically, these are kind of the guardrails for the law. It's kind of how does the how do we implement those things that the legislation has, and legislators have told us need to be done? It's like the law says this is what you need to do. The rules basically tell us how we're going to do it. So we're right now in that 
process of getting some permanent rules uh, and, and really trying to create those. And so we're on the final stages of, of kind of going through our second round of edits. And so we, we wrote the rules once, we put it out into a public comment where people could look at them, the, the, all the citizens of Arkansas could look at them and make their comments on what they thought were good, bad, what they think may, might need to be looked at, what they think might need to be changed. We took all of those comments and we've adjusted and we made some edits and we uh, improved the rules. And so now we're just about ready to put that back out again. So hopefully by the end of maybe middle next week or so, end of next week, we hope to have those back out for public comment. They're out there for 30 days for you to look at and to make comment on. And certainly after that, we'll grab all of those public comments back and uh, we'll look and see uh, what you guys have to say. And for those that are substantive, we'll certainly try to you know look and see what we need to do inside uh, the rules to make them again, uh, fair, to make them transparent, to make them accountable, so that, again, that we're running the most efficient program possible that will benefit the most, you know, the most uh, students here in Arkansas. We expect the new enrollment cycle for all new families who are currently not in the uh, EFA program to start somewhere around late March, early April, uh, we expect the portal to open up. You, you'll you'll be getting lots of information of that. Obviously, stay tuned to the Reform Alliance and the things that they send out and their, their uh, you know, all their communications. And they'll certainly let you know when we're about ready to launch uh, the new family portal. Um, current families will start in about March. New families will probably start in around April. So just be looking for those information. We'll put it on our website. We'll send out information through our uh current EFA schools that are uh, participating, as well as uh, organizations like the Reform Alliance. And I believe, I think, I think that's just a couple of uh, contact places that you can use. Certainly, uh, you can get on our website and it'll tell you a little bit about the program. You can call me. I'm going to give you my cell phone number. Uh, if you want to, you can text me or call me at the end of today's uh, presentation. So, Emmy, don't let me get off here without sharing my uh, my my number. Uh, you can certainly email me, uh, and I'll give you that as well. Uh, you can check out on social media. You can check out the Reform Alliance. There's uh, lots of resources there. They're phenomenal support for the EFA program, and they can help answer your questions. They can help walk you through the application. Uh, they can, uh, if they don't have the answer, they usually call me and I will give them and then they'll give you the answer. And so uh, we're, we're, they're here to help. We're here to help. We're here to support you. We're here to make this program run. We're here to help you um, with this program and help make it make sense for you. And it also to make sure that you have the choices that you want for your family so that you can make the best quality choices uh, for the education of your kids. And so we certainly want to make sure that uh, the program is, is a beneficial for everybody. So I think that is the last of the actual slides. And uh, certainly at this point, uh, I mean, if you want to just kind of throw some questions out there, we'll uh, see what we can do. Yes, we got a lot of good ones while you were going through. Awesome. Um, and then we had some that were previously submitted as well, just while we were preparing for this. Yeah. Um, so you did mention that the timeline for student applications would be, um, you know, previous uh, participants for this school year, March, and then April for the new ones, roughly. Right. Um, so do you have a timeline for providers when they will be able to apply? We, we believe that uh, both new private schools that want to enter into the program, as well as service providers, uh, that probably in that same late March, early April will be the time when their application opens as well. And so we want to, uh, again, kind of just stay tuned, keep looking the, for the, at uh, our social media, look on our website, check out the Reform Alliance uh, information out there with information that you guys are putting out. And uh, we will let you guys know as soon as th those applications are available. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you why everything's kind of getting pushed a little bit into the late spring, just, just for context. So part of the uh, the law required us to kind of go through a, you know, a bidding process for the person or the, the group. So that's going to kind of help us um, manage the program. You know, the, the group that's going to do the applications and help us with the expenses and disbursements and those type of, it's what Class Wallet is doing right now. 
And so uh, while Class Wallet did year one, they weren't guaranteed a year two. And so we had to go through this bidding process. And, and so uh, right now we're in the middle of that. We're kind of finalizing that process. Uh, we hope to have a new vendor selected here in the next few weeks. Uh, once the new vendor gets selected and they kind of go through all the contract pieces and get everything signed and approved, uh, which we hope will be towards the end of February, then we can start working with them, get the new application in place, which will then start uh, the year two cycle. And so that's a little bit while we pushed it. To, it's getting kind of pushed back into a little bit later in the spring than maybe we would have had uh, uh, originally or where, where it will be going forward uh, in, in years to come. But just, just for context of why we're pushing everything into that, that late March, early April timeframe. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Lots of processes. <laughs> yep, yep. Lots of things going on. <laughs> Uh, for the families that are already enrolled, will they need to reapply or what will that process look like for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So if once you're in the program, you're in the program. And so uh, so there's no reason that you'll have to reapply. Basically, what you have to do is renew. So you just have to tell us again that you want to continue to stay in the program. And so come March, you'll just, uh, if you're a current family, you'll log back into the existing portal where you did your application and, and those types of things. And uh, you'll just literally kind of check a couple boxes. Yes, I'm still interested. Here's the school that I'm planning on attending uh, in the 24-25 school year. A couple other little demographic questions that we'll ask, and then you're done. And then you have done everything that you need to do to stay in the program. And so that'll start probably mid-March would be my guess. Okay, so they won't have to provide any new documentation or anything like that. They just need to uh, verify what was in there and then tell you what school that they'll be attending. Right, yeah, there's no real application as far as new documentation uh, that you'll need to apply. We may ask for a few little things, like I said, that we were probably need to collect moving forward that we didn't necessarily be weren't able to collect this first time, but it won't be anything. It'll, it really will be a five-minute process. Okay, and then just speaking of documentation, what will new families need to apply and then how do they provide that and can, as they're going through the application, are they able to like take a photo of that? Is it, how does that work? Yeah, another great question. So new families, uh, there's a couple things you're going to have to do. First, you're going to have to show a proof of residency. So a driver's license, a utility bill, uh, something of that nature. Uh, typically, we'll ask for some type of um proof of like the student's age, you know, maybe a birth certificate or something like that, or something that has their birth date on it. Could be a report card, uh, just something official that has the birth date. So we can just check the birth date and make sure uh, kind of where they fit in the in the things. <clears throat> then there will be the eligibility requirements. So you'll have to, you know, of those eligibility um, criteria that we talked about earlier, you'll check one of those. And then each one of those has different types of documentation required. So for instance, if you have a student with an IDEA diagnosed disability, you're going to need to provide a note from a doctor, a qualified that's qualified to make that diagnosis that says that my child has this, you know, uh, this learning disability, whether it's ADHD, dyslexia, autism, whatever. Um, you know, and and have somebody do that. If you're a military person, you just need to show us that you, you know, something that shows that you're in the military or that you're an active duty or that you're a veteran. Um, if you're a first responder, again, same kind of thing, just something that shows that you're a firefighter or an emergency medical personnel, law enforcement. Uh, so just some type of documentation that verifies why you chose that particular criteria uh, as evidence of, of that particular area. And then that's really basically it. And then there's a couple of checkboxes you'll have to sign and just some things that says, hey, I'm going to keep the rules and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to and I'm going to use the money for what it's for, uh, you know, those types of things. And so that's really it. Uh, this year, I think if you talk to the families that went through it, it was a fairly simple process and fairly fluid. And as long as you have some of that documentation ready to go, uh, when you start, it, it's 10 minutes maybe tops as far as really getting through the process. Uh, and even if you don't, you can always stop and start. Like you get through it and say, ah, oh, I forgot to pick up. You can always save it. Go get your documentation, bring it up. So you're just going to upload pictures of your driver's license, a utility bill, or 
uh, a doctor's note, you know, if again, in the case of disabilities or, you know, uh, copies of your um, your or military orders or something that shows you're in law enforcement, firefighters, EMT, you know, those types of things. Okay, perfect. And I will just note there that our office is always happy to help people apply and upload those documents if they are having um, any troubles with that. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> But while you were, I know you mentioned first responders when you were going through some of the categories, and I know that this may be addressed in the rulemaking process, but do you have any information on how exactly that's going to be defined? And would that include volunteer first responders, such as volunteer firefighters? So so the basically the Arkansas law kind of defines first responders for us. And so it says it's firefighters. Uh, it is emergency medical providers or emergency medical personnel or officials. And emergency medical provider, uh, I guess, in essence, means anyone who attends, who uh, shows up at an emergency, in, in an emergency or at, an, at a scene prior to the hospital. So uh, so basically the way we're defining it is that any person who, who shows up for uh, on the scene of an emergency or is in the midst of an emergency prior to making it to that person going to the hospital. So not hospital personnel. Um, and so and yes, volunteer fire departments and volunteer firemen uh, are would be considered uh, eligible for the EFA program. Okay, and we did have a parent ask specifically, what about water department workers who um, are, they qualify as a first responder under the Department of Labor definitions? I'd have to look at that. Uh, that's not, that wasn't in our original definition, but we can certainly, uh, I will take a note and uh, we'll, we'll look at that and see uh, what that, where that definition is. Okay, perfect. I had never heard of that before, so I was. Yeah, that's, that's a new one. So, to make sure to ask. know that the water department is uh, an emergency responder. Uh, <laughs> so we will we'll, we'll definitely take a peek and and see. Perfect, perfect. Um, so I know you said that the application process, while the parents are going through it, doesn't take very long, maybe ten minutes. Of course, you can stop and start. Um, but when will families know whether they've been approved or not? Do you have kind of a timeline on the approval process once that begins? Yes. So a lot of that kind of depends on where you're at and how many people are in the system at the time. I mean, we'll, we have a full team of, of people working on that eight hours a day once we get into the, the bulk of the, you know, at, at the, of the uh, application season. Uh, typically at its busiest, I would say that Usually within three to four days, um, you know, you would have from the time that you submit to the time that you would have an answer. Uh, a lot of times, though, if we don't have to write some documentation or if we still have some questions about your application, we'll send it back and ask for additional documentation or maybe some couple of questions that we still have. And then you can resubmit. But typically, I would say, you know, at, at the longest is maybe, you know, four days if we're really just swamped. Uh, you know, there were times this in, in this past season where, you know, we had 1500 applications, you know, over a two day period that we were trying to try to get through. So you can imagine if, we, you know, with a team that's well trained and doing a really, really good job, if they can get through, you know, 50 to 70 a day. And, you know, so and, and then obviously, the, you know, we'll get 10 or 12 people working on it. So we can probably get through five, six, seven hundred of them a day. Um, so depending on, you know, how fast we can get through it and how many people we can put on the, at, on the task at that, at, at a given time, uh, we can process them relatively quickly, but be a little patient with those, especially when things first open in those first couple of weeks after the, after the portal opens, when we know that there's going to be a lot of people trying to get into the system early, uh, as obviously as the end of it, get, as we get towards the end of it, it goes a little faster because there's not quite as many to process at one time. So generally speaking, three to five days okay. on, at, at, at the, at the busiest. Okay. Well, perfect. That is a very quick turnaround. Um, <laughs> Um, so I did have a couple questions that kind of go together. So sure. they said, if your school is in the process of applying, are you still able to apply at the same time or do you have to wait until they're approved? And then the other question said, do you already have to know which school, private or homeschooling, you plan to use when you're applying? So let me answer the first, second question first. 
No, you can apply and go ahead and get in the system. Go ahead and, and apply whether you know the school you're going to or don't know the school you're going to. Or even if the school, you know that the school that you're applying to is not there yet, hasn't been approved, but you know they're working towards being approved. So the first thing it says, really, it's a two-step process. Step one is to be approved as a student. So, so let's kind of just set that, do that first, meet the eligibility requirement, get in, now you're in. Second step then is to tell us what school you might be going to. So that, you know, th that can wait a little bit uh, because again, we don't really need that information till, you know, late May, early June, you know, right in that area, probably as we start really trying to figure out where everybody's at and getting ready for that first disbursement in August, as far as, you know, the payments and those types of things. So uh, certainly I would recommend and encourage everyone to get in the system first. Go ahead and get approved. Make sure that all that's taken care of, and then you can work on, you know, getting uh, telling us where you're going to go to school if you're going to be a homeschooler. Uh, if let's just say that you think, well, we're thinking about going to private school, and then you know, a couple months later, you change your mind and say we're just going to do homeschool. That's fine. You log back in, check a different criteria, uh, let us know. As long as you meet the eligibility criteria, it really doesn't matter. Uh, whether you're homeschool or private school at that point. Uh, but but for our records, just so we know kind of how many homeschoolers we have in the system and how many those that are attending private school or micro schools, uh, just for our own demographic information, we will we'll want you just to keep, a, you know, help us to have good, accurate records. So like I said, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you're homeschool or not. If you're, if you're eligible and you're approved, then you're approved and you're good. And then you can kind of, if you need to make some changes down the road, that's fine. Log back in, make the changes. Okay, perfect. And I know that you just said that you can go from homeschooling to private school, private school to homeschooling. What about switching from one private school to another? Is that the same process? Is that allowed? Is there a limit on that? Yep. So um, no limit and certainly eligible because again, you know, the point of choice is to make the best choice for your students. And sometimes we we start someplace and we think it's going to be a great fit for our, our, our student for one reason or another. It, it's maybe not what we thought or it doesn't quite meet the needs that, of, of our students that as like we thought and we need to try something else. And certainly we want to give parents that option. And so the parents have the option to you know, go to go from one school to another school if they feel like, you know, another school is going to meet their uh, meet their needs better. And there is a process for that. The schools know what that process is. I mean, basically, there's a withdrawal process. Uh, and depending on where you are in the semester and where you are in the payment cycles and those kind of things, there's typically potentially some refunding that needs to go back uh, where the school might need to put some money back into the student's account so they could use it for the next school. Um, you know, those types of things. But a lot of that just depends on where you are in that uh, in that quarterly cycle. And so but and the schools will help walk parents through that and will help parents know exactly what, you know, if there's a refund coming to their account, if there's not how much there's a how much of that refund is going to come to their account uh, so that they'll have that to, to use maybe at the new school. Now, with that said, if, uh, you know, if they, we find a family that's jumping a bunch, you know, like every two months, we're just changing schools. We may have a conversation uh, about that because we certainly, while we believe in choice and we believe in, um, you know, and in and, and parents making what's the best choice for their students, we certainly also know that stability is important as well. Uh, you know, stability for the students, stability for the, for the uh, schools, because, uh, you know, they're planning based on the number of students who who sign up and and are enrolled in their schools so they're staffing for that and so they're planning budgets around that and so we want to be fair to them as well uh, certainly don't want to limit choice but if we do find some families that are you know doing a lot of school hopping uh, and i mean you know four or five times a year kind of thing not like i just changed schools uh, it, it would at least warrant a conversation okay perfect um so m moving more towards the provider side, um, do you have any sense of what the qualifications will be for those learning service providers um, to, be to become authorized? Well, again, I guess it probably depends on what type of service provider you're talking about. Because, I mean, there's going to be there's therapists, which are providing services. Uh, there's tutors. 
again, that are providing kind of very specific services. Uh, then there's more of the um, kind of the homeschool co-op type teacher uh, provider. Uh, certainly, we would expect um, those that are in any type of full-time teaching of a student, uh, whether it's a subject or all subjects, to uh, have the, the qualifications necessary to teach that particular subject. Uh, we would certainly uh, expect them to have at least a college degree, a bachelor's degree, or, or at least equivalent experience is the way I think the law reads that they have to have it in that particular subject area. So if I'm a, I'm going to teach math, then we need to know that you have some experience teaching math and that there's a reason that, that you can, uh, that you can teach math and that you can justify that uh, you're capable of teaching that and helping to ensure that the students that you're teaching uh, are going to receive the education that they need, that they're going to be able to, uh, you know, um, reach the academic outcomes that are necessary that we would like to see our students reach. Because again, what we're trying to do is provide a high quality education for all students in Arkansas. And so we want to make sure those that are teaching uh, can do that. And so, so part of that qualifications or part of the application for service providers is basically to ensure and to tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of justify, if, if you want to use that word, why you can teach these students that subject. Okay. Um, uh, so when the providers were applying for the LEARNS tutoring grant programs, do you know if they will have to apply again to now be a part of the EFA program or how will that work? Yeah, those are two separate programs. Uh, so the, for especially those that are like, I guess in the uh, public school right now that may have been get, getting letters or will be getting letters maybe uh, about the uh, literacy program or the tutoring program, which is a $500 grant literally to, to help uh, improve literacy for their child. Uh, and so um, they can do that, but that's a separate, uh, kind of a separate pot of money. That's a separate program. And so while you will enroll, you may, you, may, you're, you may use the same portal and the same platform to enroll, you're still enrolling in two separate programs. So there's a separate application, I guess, for both, for, for each individual program. Okay, so if they did apply to be a provider on that, they will also have to apply to be a provider. Yes, yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and then we also had some questions about micro schools. So like what qualifies a micro school to accept EFA funds? Um, and are those considered a homeschool expense? So I'll, again, I'll answer the second question first. So yes, it is considered, uh, it, it is an eligible expense. So what if, because it's providing instructional, uh, you know, uh, education is providing you using instructional material and it's kind of, kind of like a tutoring, a tutor almost, you know, um, so yes, it is an eligible expense. Micro school is kind of a new word that's been tossed around nowadays. You know, it's not something that a lot of people have heard uh, of. I, I guess probably in Arkansas, the easiest thing, the way to kind of envision that is like a homeschool co-op. It's more than that, uh, you know, but but I think if you had to get a picture in your brain, that's probably the easiest way to picture it. It's a, a group of homeschool families getting together. Uh, and whether that's five or 10 or 15 of those families getting together in one area and uh, being taught by one or more teachers. Uh, and so um, what will classify that will kind of depend on the way it's set up you know, as far as the way a micro school is set up. So again, that's going to be kind of um, between the parent and those that they choose to have teaching their, their kids. And so if a parent wants um teacher X to be a provider for their students and teach them chemistry, then um, then that provider will have to then go through the process of becoming a, you know, a service provider for the EFA program. Once approved, then that provider will do just like everybody else does. They'll provide the family with an invoice and then this, you know, we will, we will pay that particular provider, tutor, teacher, whoever, uh, based on that invoice. Okay. Um, so we did have a question about some of the funding, and then I want to go back to some of the uh, the provider questions that we've gotten. Sure. Um, it says, uh, 
do you know the amount that will be allotted to students with ADHD? So is it a weighted amount? Do you have the set amount? And do you know what that amount will be for next year? The only thing that's changed, the only thing that's weighted, I guess, right now is succeed. Succeed, the succeed students are the ones that were awarded the succeed scholarship for this school year will continue to re uh, receive 100% of the foundation funding, which I believe next year is 7618. Don't quote me on that number exactly, but it's in the ballpark. Um, uh, and then, so everybody else, so if you're a non-succeed student, it's 90% of that, which I believe is 69 or 68, 76, I think. I had that number this afternoon. And <laughs> I, so don't quote me on it quite yet. I'll find it. If you'll give me a second while we're doing it, I'll look it back up and I'll tell you exactly what it is so that I can. That's uh, no problem. We can definitely send that information out after. I wouldn't expect you to <laughs> do all that math in your head. <laughs> um. So yeah, we will we will definitely provide that. But the only difference in any kind of funding structure for the students is if they were in the Succeed Scholarship Program in 22, 23, then continued. So next year, they'll continue to get that higher funding amount. But nobody else in those different categories has a weighted amount with them. Like if they have mm -hmm. a disability or they're homeless or a kindergartner, it's all going to be the same. That's correct. Okay. Um, so we did have some homeschool families that are asking how this is going to affect their homeschool curriculum choices. Are they going to be required to take the, um, testing and, um, will the curriculum be left to the parent of the homeschooler or will there be requirements on the curriculum? So no requirements on the curriculum. Again, it's your choice. You are the parent. You are responsible for, obviously, as a, from a homeschooler, you're responsible for the education of your child. And so you can choose the curriculum that you feel like fits best with uh, for, for your child. So we're not going to get into the, the, you have to do a certain thing or you have to take a certain curriculum or you have to do, as long as you're teaching math and science and social studies and uh, English, you know, our ELA, then we're good. Uh, and so, uh, you know, whether it's faith based or not faith based, that's not that not our, that really doesn't concern us. Um, uh, yes, you will have to take uh, some type of a norm reference test that is in law. So everybody who receives EFA funding is required to take a test uh, of some sort, um, whether it's um, you don't mess, you know, again, that, that could be the Stanford, that could be Iowa Basic Skills. Uh, there's a list of about 15 or 16 different approved tests right now, norm reference tests that a parent can choose from. And so, like, again, they can take the one that fits best with what, what they're teaching and how they're teaching, um, those types of things. Certainly, you know, I know that uh, a lot of times they can work with a, uh, at a private school in their area that maybe uh, obviously they take their summative test in the spring, just like everybody else. Uh, and so a lot of a lot of private schools will allow homeschool students to uh, test with them. Um, if, if they, you know, if you just can't find any place, we'll certainly, again, help support you in helping find a, a way or be able to contact the the uh, test provider to make sure that you can take um, to take tests. There's a lot of homeschool options for to taking tests, you know, especially for the Stanford and Iowa basic skills there. They they're built a lot around homeschool families. And so we can certainly help you uh, can guide you through that process. So. OK, Are I've there... got your number for you. Hold on. I'm gonna get you. I got your number. I told you I'd find it for you. I've got your number. <laughs> OK, I, I, I fill it up. So here it is. So 7618 is what a succeed scholarship student would take. So you'll get that's about nineteen hundred and four dollars a quarter so remember everything's paid quarterly so it's not paid monthly it's not and, and but so you're going to get every quarter you're going to get 19 if you're a succeed student nineteen hundred and four dollars put into your account okay. and then based on the invoices you'll kind of pay it down based on how you spend that money uh non-succeed students will receive six thousand eight hundred and fifty six dollars uh per year that breaks down to about one thousand seven hundred and fourteen dollars per quarter Okay, so again, it's paid quarterly, first quarterly payments, usually around August, kind of mid-August, then around November, March, May are the four, kind of the kind of your four quarterly payments. Okay, and that will all go through the service provider like Class Wallet or 
whoever, whoever the vendor is, yeah, whoever's managing the the EFA program for us, that's that they'll help us with that process. I mean, the state pop, puts it in there. We'll put it into their the the vendor will put it into the student account. The the families then upload the invoices, which will then be paid from their account. Okay. Um, and then we had a question. If my curriculum is not in the approved vendors, can I still submit a receipt for a reimbursement? Um, well, again, I don't know that uh, we're not, we don't do reimbursements. Let me just put that. So there's not a reimbursement portion of EFA, uh, but there's not really a, a vendor. I mean, I guess the idea would be that we try to get as many vendors in the process as we can. Uh, if there, if there's an issue with that and for some reason they, they can't be, I don't, I'm like, I can't, that's what I can't imagine a circumstance that a curriculum provider wouldn't be approved. All they've got to do is basically give us the information and uh, you know, and, and fill out the form and we will go through that. Cause they're obviously the uh, product type vendors. Uh, there's a lot less scrutiny uh, on a product vendor, but rather than a face, you know, a, a, a person who's dealing face to face with a student. Um, so if we find that you, for whatever reason, your curriculum provider can't, doesn't want to be part of our, the EFA program, uh, let us know and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. But certainly the, the way it works is that, you know, we want the providers to be part inside the system because that's where we can provide the most accountability and transparency uh, for state funds. Okay, so just no reimbursements. As long as you get all of your stuff approved prior to some of the funding coming out or prior to starting your school year, you should be good to go on all of that. You should be. And so, that, and again, that's probably a good uh a good place to say it's, it's probably important to kind of start early, especially if you're a homeschool parent, maybe if you feel like there might be some difficulty in, in getting your, making sure that your providers on uh, the system uh, is to really let's, let's start that in early summer, you know, or late May and start trying to work with your provider to make sure that we can get them onto the system so that there's no delay in you getting your curriculum. Um, you know, those types of things. So um, I, I would just, that, that's a, I guess a good caution for especially for those that are uh, homeschool parents to to start early and to make sure that we can get your providers in, inside the system. Okay, perfect. Oh, I remembered what I was going to say. Oh, um, good. I'm sorry. I interrupted you while I go. Oh, no, you are totally fine. Um, so I just had some questions about the testing. Are there exemptions for that? What is the, I guess, purpose of it? Um, is the student information going to be public? How is that? Like, what are the parameters surrounding that? Sure. So everyone's required to test unless based on your uh, learning disability or something, you would be exempt from testing. And there's a, and there's a, some qualifications there. If you certainly, if, uh, if you have an IEP or if you, you know, a doctor that says, Hey, they're just, their learning uh, um, challenge right now is such is severe enough that they, they they wouldn't qualify for testing. And at that point, then you can provide as a portfolio or some kind of other diagnostic testing or something to show us that they're making progress. You know, they they have they're they're doing what they need to do based on their particular, you know, where they are academically. Uh, so that's probably the only way you can get an exemption. Uh, the data itself, we're not out gonna say, hey, homeschool kid five, you know, scored this. I mean, that's that's not the purpose. I mean, we're going to aggregate that data. Uh, again, in no way are we going to uh, put out information that would be identifiable uh, for any student. So we're looking at it more, and it's a big picture. We're looking at it, again, I guess from a individual, we're just kind of looking to see that these things are being done, that, again, that students are receiving a high quality education and that they are making academic progress uh, regardless of where they start. And so uh, we want to, that's kind of what we want to look at, but it's from a public reporting standpoint, those, that data will be aggregated into like big numbers. Okay. So it's not so much about passing a test. It's about showing growth while you're utilizing the program. Exactly. We just want to know that kids, that kids are, that, that, that the choices that, that that students are getting a high quality education, uh, regardless of where they start, because we know everybody starts at a different place. And, and we certainly are not here to say, you've got to hit this mark or else. 
Um, but we do want to make sure that, that the students that are, uh, you know, using EFA funds, just like we do with public funds and public schools, that that everyone's getting a good quality education. And, and we want to make sure that um, uh, ensure that that's that's what's happening and that parents are getting, you know, the quality education that they deserve. Um, well, I think that's great. Um, <laughs> well, I'm glad. <laughs> I, I knew you were worried. Um, if my child receives the EFA now and we decide to go to a public school next year, is their slot saved? Or how does that work? Um, so if you're in the program and then for whatever reason decide you want to step out of the program for a while, uh, you're you're you kind of become inactive, but your account is still open for two years. So uh, you're there now, if you decide, you know, to stay out of the program for two years and then five years later decide you want to pop back in, then you'll probably have to kind of go through that reapplication process. But you basically have a two year window to kind of move in and out. You know, if you decide for whatever reason that you need to step out of the program and uh, try something else for your child then we'll hold that spot for, for two years. Now, it's not going to be funded. We're not putting money in it. It just kind of becomes dormant. It becomes inactive. But you can reactivate it without any type of reapplication. Okay. Um, perfect. Uh, so kind of in that same vein, if all of the received funds are not used, do they roll over or do they go back into the program? How does that work? I guess there's different instances where that would be um, kind of the question. Yeah. So beginning next year, so the 23-24 school, so it's the current school year that we're in, at the end of this year, the money goes back to the state so that no money rolls over. So everybody kind of starts from scratch again. Uh, now, starting next year, the beginning of the 24-25 school year and beyond, if there's money remaining at the end of the school year, it just rolls over. Now, you can do that for a while, and then after there is a limit on how much money you can just store up uh, in, in your account, uh, and that, that'll be defined in the rules, but it's a pretty substantial amount of money. It's not like five bucks. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it'll be there so that you can go, because a lot of times, uh, maybe elementary is a little cheaper. And then when you get into to the upper grades, it becomes more expensive. And so while you had money left over uh, at the beginning of your academic life cycle, you know, when you get towards the end where it's a little bit more expensive, uh, you know, maybe the funds that you had don't necessarily cover full tuition. But if you can basically kind of create it like a little savings account for a certain while, then you'll have that money ready for high school or middle school or high school as you move on. So we wanted we wanted to create that opportunity for parents to to kind of kind of think ahead a little bit, especially sometimes if they're in some elementaries that are um, where their tuition is less than the total amount allotted. Uh, that will they will be able to roll that over from year to year. Uh, I'm not totally sure. I don't want to just throw out an amount right now, but it's like I said, it's a fairly substantial amount, uh, like a good probably years worth of tuition. I would think that you could at least uh, plus that you would be able to save over time. Okay, perfect. Um, so what if they leave the program? So what happens like if someone were to attend for half the school year and then they went to a public school, now their slot is open for that kind of two-year window to move in and out. Are Do the funds stay in their account or do they kind of start over if they come back? Uh, again, the funds will stay there probably for the remainder of that year. Uh, and then at that point, uh, and, I, and I think the way the and I think the way the rules have were written, and again, I'm, I'll have to double check this because the things we've kind of gone back and forth on that, um, is that the funds will stay there if you're there for two years, and then they leave. Okay. Uh, you just don't get, you, but you just don't get any new funds put into your account, right? Uh, and so they'll stay there for you so that until your two year cycle is over, and then they would be they would be removed. Okay, and just roll back to the state. Right. And then so you'd start off with just zero if you came back into the program. Okay, and I know we're coming up against the time, so I just want to get a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so is a child who has a step parent who is in the military or a veteran or first responder or any of those parent categories still eligible? 
it's a, as long as it's a step parent, yes. And so the child that that parent is obviously part of that immediate family, uh, then yes. So it, it just, it, I think it just goes back. It's got to be the immediate family. So even if maybe the child doesn't have full custody and they don't necessarily live with that particular um, you know, a family member, you know, whether it's maybe they have a step parent, but they live with the mom or vice versa. Um, as long as they're part of that immediate family entity, then yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and then income is not a factor at all in the program. Nope, there is no income qualification at all. So the eligibility criteria that we covered at the beginning of the presentation. That's the eligibility criteria. 2526, the criteria is you're a resident of Arkansas. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then last one, promise. <laughs> How often does the testing have to be done? Testing is an annual uh, an annual requirement. So every year that you're in the program, you have to submit testing. Okay. Um, if they are homeschooled or something like that, I know you said that you would assist them with that. Do they just submit that stuff directly to you or will there be a process for them to submit those uh, tests? Or like testing like the, result. the result. Yeah. So basically everybody, if they're part of a school, there's a, there, there'll be a system that the school will report. If you're not part of a school, then yes, we'll, we'll send out some different information or ways that you can do that. We, we anticipate um, once the new platform vendor is selected, that they'll be able to log into their account and put the and uh, report their test data right there on their account. Uh, that's our anticipation. That's our goal behind that. So everything literally is put into one place so that we're not having to log into five different places or send three different emails or or anything like that. It really is to kind of create a one-stop shop that log in and you can do everything. You can, um, you know, you can uh, take care of your expenses. You can take care of the, uh, the, the fund disbursements. You can do all the reporting that's required all in one place. And so that's what we're working towards. So again, that that it's, it's a very simple process for our families. It's efficient for everybody uh, and it's easy to use. Okay, I think that's fantastic. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we get off here? Well, I, like I said, please, uh, I, I, there may be more questions out there. This and, and we may have generated more questions than what we were able to answer. And so, uh, feel free again to contact the office, the Department of Education School of Office uh, School of School uh, Office of School Choice and uh, Parental Empowerment. Uh, you can find us on the ADE website. Uh, you can. Contact me directly on my at my email, which is Daryl D A R R E L L dot Smith at ADE dot Arkansas dot gov. It's a whole bunch of stuff there. If you're not just if you'll again get on the website, it shows that. Um, I'll also give you my cell phone number, so you can certainly you know, text me or call me, and I'll be more than happy to try to help answer your question. It's 501-231-2385. and so you can certainly like again call me, text me. Uh, I, I usually do a pretty good job of getting back with you relatively quickly, uh, or at least get somebody else to, or you know, have somebody contact you and see if they can help you and answer your questions. So um, please let us know. Don't um, if if you don't if you have a question, ask. You know, we we are here to answer your questions. I know the Reform Alliance is here to help answer your questions, and uh, and they're really good at it. So you know, don't hesitate to ask the question because there is no dumb question and we want, we really want good information out there and we want you to have the right information. And so we would certainly prefer you to ask us and let us give you the right information and help direct you the right way so that, so that you will, um, it, it will help you in the process and help you be more efficient in it. And it'll help you kind of get through it uh, the best way possible. So I, I would just say, just, just ask the questions, you know, and, and just know that we're here and available to answer for you. Yes. And we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone that attended the call with a form on there where if we did not get to your question, because there were a lot of questions and we tried to get to as many as possible. Um, but if we did not get to yours, you can submit it there as well. And then we will follow up with you um, again. You know, if we don't know the answer, we will get in touch with Daryl and make sure that we can figure that out. Um, and then we also recorded tonight's call and we'll be posting it to our YouTube channel just in case you want to go back and watch it. Um, and then 
if you would like to follow up with us, our office phone number is 501-244-9028, or you can find us at thereformalliance.org. Um, thank you, Daryl, so much for joining us tonight. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we hope this was helpful. Great. I appreciate you guys hosting this. Thank you very much. Good night. Take care, everybody.